right, right where back up, right? We're still enjoying ourselves, we're working much. Finished with getting Lund, uh, HR's presentation. Do you have any staffing or HR questions uh, for Debbie? I'd just like to acknowledge uh, that we, I, I, I advocated we take her internet access away. She comes into my office too often and tells me things I need to know that I wish I didn't know. <laughs> um, but uh, she's brought a lot of new information forward, um, practices that we need to implement, uh, the, the web portal for our applications I think is, is invaluable and I think she did more on self-preservation because of all the hiring that we're doing. But uh, you know, in the four years uh, I've been there, we've never not had a job opening. It's crazy. Um, the, and I think it's primarily the economy and um, our strong work of the jobs market here in, in Fort Orchard and Kitsap County uh, is, is the bulk of contributors. We've had some retirement and most often, and it, isn't, it isn't always about it's just, it's just, there's just a lot of, if you're, if you're, if you're skilled labor, there's jobs that out there to be had. There's no doubt about it. So, questions for Denny? You can elaborate a little bit about the online application. So, if you simply the application that you can fill out online or your approximate mind. It's through a separate company. Um, this company called NeoJet. They work with local government, well, several states, the state of Washington. If you were to apply for jobs in the state of Washington, they use NeoJet. It has two purposes. One, it primarily my driver just well, okay, self-preservation, to be honest. But two <laughs> second, it was from the applicant perspective. Instead of getting a paper form to fill out, put in a typewriter that no longer exists, um, it's very simple. You have one standard application for you. If you're in the job market, you're, then you're set up in the open. Um, and you have a few supplemental questions to answer. So it all comes electronically to us. I route the applications electronically to the to the hiring managers. They review it. They can rank it electronically. We typically have a panel of people, so then I can compile those rankings and see who votes to the top. The interviews, I can answer them. I can email all applicants out from the system itself in an email blast. I don't have to type those emails. They're already out in there. So it's just efficiency. Applicant can also check on the status of their application and see where they're at in the process. Neo, N-E-O, Gov. It's easier for the directors to go in and review all the kind of applications where they're at. The new ones come in like it's much more user friendly. That's cloud based and sit at home and be watching the football game and looking at the application. It has some features you can turn off, like if you don't want resumes or you don't want to know people graduated from college to the tech age of the mission. So again, a great note of innovation that we're embracing in the city. Um, you're going to hear that theme, at least for me, a lot as far as operational improvements. So before we jump in, I want to talk about IT real briefly. Um, so I'm going to try to keep my next couple talks to 10 minutes and then turn over to everybody to get it closely back to that schedule. Uh, IT achievements in 2019. So we've recently come to an agreement with Wave Broadband and Voice Data Services, uh, which gives us the ability to take more control of our own system. Uh, we're not going to be on the county anymore, which will save us about $9,000 annually and gives uh, our IT manager, Steve, controls that he hasn't had before in order to open up portals for those that want to be in um, and other services like that. Uh, we've deployed 17 new computers as part of a four-year workstation refresh. Um, so we continually try to update our technology uh, that is outdated. Computers get quickly outdated as we all are realizing very quickly whether it's an iPad, an iPhone, uh, Samsung, doesn't matter whether the technology gets outdated really quickly. And it's equally true with our computer systems. Um, so we've been building in a program similar to ENR that we monitor with computers all this, and we refresh them and bring them in. Uh, we implemented uh, workstation management software, which allows us to be more efficient in how we deploy software. So we have icons on each desktop. 
where Steve can remotely access each computer and deploy the software as needed or updates um, before we were running around each computer station, take it one at a time. So again, embrace the technology to help us become more efficient. Um, we've implemented uh, additional auditing and security. Uh, security is a big issue right now. So we are really focused on the IT side on security and um, preventing uh, bugs. Um, and lately it's been a lot of data breaches. There's been a lot of um, communication on the Iran threats um, on, in the IT world and how they are preparing to attack through the cyber networks. So we are heavily focused on preventing that and what policies we need to put in place to ensure employees don't respect you appropriately. Uh, so all good things that come with having a full-time IT manager that's best in the city and that's best in what, where we're going. Um, overall, Steve has actually saved us about fifteen dollars to $20,000 by looking at what we were doing, the programs we had, and looking what was out there and changing it um, to suit our business model. And one example is the moving away from the county, the savings we received there. The other is looking at converting 365 licenses from a monthly subscription uh, to an annual payment with Microsoft. It's the same product, nothing changed. We just looked at the different business products they offer, and we were in the wrong module. So why are we buying it here? Let's go wholesale, let's go this way. And we looked at it and said it makes sense. So he's doing a great job, uh, not just keeping us up to date, but looking at the efficiency we can gain uh, for business practices. I have included in here, and, uh, a snapshot of some ID data on the help desk results. Um, again, this helps us to focus our efforts in IT. What is it that we're having issues on when employees are putting in an IT help desk? If you recall, two years ago, we didn't have this in place. We worked with Steve said, hey, how are we getting information from you? Everyone was picking up the phone or walking to our desk. We said, let's have a, an email in which people could actually put in an IT help desk ticket. It allowed us to better track the data and actually respond more effectively. Uh, so again, this is a snapshot of the type of issues we come across. Uh, for our budget plan going forward, it's pretty much on track. Uh, use IT help desk to target our investments, our standard workstation rotation, renewing our subscriptions and software, looking at hardware, continuing training. Uh, our new request is going to be looking at, I think I may have mentioned this before, but we're looking at a citywide intranet. Okay, that's accessible to only city employees. What this will allow us to do as managers is to have a platform in which we can put all our policies that are city approved, all our forms that are city approved, in a single location that every employee has access to. Currently, we all have different shared drives, we all have different folders, and if you experience working in an office environment, we are not, humans are not very good at organizing, managing folders and data. We tend to create another file, another folder, recatalog, and it tends to grow. So the IT, uh, excuse me, the intranet is a central place where the mayor can push out messages, messages from the mayor talking about the city, talking about uh, snow events, uh, to all employees as well as accessing the standard and approved documents, policies, and procedures. So they won't have to ask, they have a place to go get it. Individuals for each department then that also allows us to uh, translate that same work into for our department. So in my department, for example, we are developing standardized checklists and procedures for every position. So rather than have those documents stored on my folder or Rebecca's folder, we're going to put that on the internet, one location where everyone can find it and there is no uh, multiple versions of it. So we're trying to control the versions of documents as well. Um, the other piece we're going to look for going forward is becoming a smart city. And I believe we talked about this briefly in our last retreat. Um, we haven't made much head on it, but a couple things what a smart city is, is moving towards an electronic uh, records management system. I think you've heard that several times today as an important peg piece. Also, process automation. Uh, smart water meter readers. So rather than sitting out a meter reader, we have technology there that allows us to turn off the water, turn it on, take reads. All our smart technologies that cities are embracing to move forward in this new era. Uh, asset and fleet management. I'll be talking about that over the next couple months, about how we are managing our assets with uh, partnership with Public Works Dollar. Department had plans to institute a planning policy and then move towards a system which can help us better inform how we're investing in our assets. If you think about we're investing a lot of money right now in the capital purchase and replacement of the assets, but how are we programming replacement over time and how are we managing our time? Uh, that will be upcoming months, so we'll be talking about stuff like that. So with that, I'm going to transition to the real topic I want to talk about with your uh, process.
It gives us the ability to go paperless in an accounts payable and other processes throughout the city with complete auto controls, record management, and automation. Uh, it allows us to be compliant, to become compliant, and automated with our records retention, archiving, and destruction. Again, what this system will allow us to do is when a document comes in, we will have programmed in what this type of document is. It will automatically get stored into its retention schedule. So if it's so going to be retention schedule for six years, it is stored there, and it is automatically flagged for when it comes up for destruction. It is now flagged automatically. We are not having five people trying to figure out what this document is, when does it need to be um, retained, for how long, when does it need to be destroyed, and what box does it need to go in with a dance on that side. And not to mention that it could also, that same document could be housed in all five departments, as well as multiple times throughout their own drive, their personal drive, um, that standardizes that. So it's cloud based? Yes. Yep, it is. Um, so it creates complete standard processes for routine works um, such as contracts and ordinances and staff reports. Um, right now, again, uh, what we do is we go to our folder and find our previous version and we work from that, we build from that. This will create a standardized format that everyone can go to. This is what a staff report looks like, the fields are the same, and you're really now focusing on the content. You're not worried about the headers and margins and what this is in the lace and grace version. We spend a lot of manners doing that. And the clerk's office spends probably about 15% of their time just formatting the agenda be before it sees you. So like I said, we're using previous logos, different fonts, different sizes. Sometimes they forget the motions, sometimes they forget. So we try to look out for those, and there's errors, obviously, and this will streamline that process. Absolutely. So again, Laserfish creates a logical, consistent, repeatable, and documentable processes. I want to repeat that because I think that was important. I had to focus a long time to figure out how to take this giant product and condense it down to something that is meaningful for you guys as council to understand our operational issues. It creates logical, consistent, repeatable, and documentable processes. Right now, we rely on people. People are great, but if you improve the processes, people perform higher. Um, I'm a big proponent of that. So every time we enter into a contract, ordinance, uh, staff are recreating the documents uh, as, if, as if it's the first time. And so that's a lot of wasted energy and efforts on the staff part. Um, again, it's not about people, it's about the processes. If we can standardize, streamline, and automate processes uh, so that the people do not have to spend non-value added time identifying, rethinking, and recreating things that should be standard on a daily basis. Uh, I brought this example up, I wanted to have a video of it, but we said we didn't have time. Uh, I hope most of you are familiar with Abbott Costello. Everybody knows who Abbott Costello, yeah? Yeah, well I, I talked to my staff, they didn't know, so that's why I didn't know if this would go over well. Uh, then who's on first routine? Yes? Yeah, so that's what it's like when we're trying to work through standard routines. It's who's on first. I don't know what's on second, I don't know what's on third. He has another routine. That's exactly what we go through as people in our offices to figure out how things should flow through. This eliminates that. Um, another example I want to throw out is we can identify a suite of standard contract templates, which we're going to work through with Charlotte, across all departments and develop a standard workflow for these documents. Uh, again, this will allow the employees to focus on the contents of the contracts and the accuracy rather than the process and the flow of the contract. And I'll give you a prime example. Uh, I'm guilty of this too, the Cytel contract. Um, it expired December 31st. As a reminder, Cytel is a um, software consultant that we use for our network services and we that contract has expired December 31st we do not have a signed contract yet um, not because of any desire we didn't want to but because we rely on people to execute multiple processes along the way um, we rely on the vendor we rely on the staff at different departments and when you rely on those people people tend to drop the ball because they get distracted with other more urgent issues a contract in this process will be managed by the system. So I can start the contract in the system, the system would deliver it to the next person, the person will be responsible for their part of that, and they would deliver it to the next person. Uh, eventually be routed to our legal consultant who would sign off on it digitally and kick it back to me or whoever is in the department requesting the contract for approval. The efficiencies we gain in an automated electronic system that's kind of managing the workflow for us is tremendous. Um, I think a huge issue too, and something that Jay's uh, brought forward, and, and I, we've all been working on it, is 
consistency in our staff reports and the, and the product we're delivering to you too. Uh, and uh, I think this could be a huge, you know, this will house a, a standard template and we'll have drop down boxes and you fill the boxes in uh, versus going back to, you know, well, we did this five years ago, but now we've updated that template and now we're, or if we're going out and grabbing things that are outdated and we've got to bring outdated practices and language forward unintentionally. Let's uh, start with, um, from say January 1st, or whenever your start date is, but does it bring in the story? Yeah. Both. Brand, brand Both. is part of it, is historic data. It's really the, it's the hub that, that grabbed all this data. We'll have all these data sources, and it, it's it's the, 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 the hub out to all of this that brings it in. It's a management tool. So. And it ties into other current um, software programs that can be integrated with it as well. So you can take all of our emails that are sitting there constantly building, and you can attach retention schedules, put it through Laserfish, and again, it ties to the retention schedule. Comes up a review, we can delete it. Yeah, and we'll come back to the, the graph, I think, right behind that. Um, the other point I want to make, so that was on the uh, workflow. Uh, next is capabilities and capacity. So you've heard our struggles with public records. Um, you might have experience in your own work. Um, but this, again, now provides us a one text, one search ability for all public records with more capabilities than we currently do now. Um, it also gives us public access to public records. So some entities, some cities will take all their approved public records and actually just put it out there, as John said, on the Laserfish link that, hey, you search it here, this is the record we have. Some entities have even taken a step further and said, we don't want to have any networks. We've got away from all our networks and storage, and we put it all on the Laserfish system so everything is public and searchable. Different tiers of what entities are doing now, um, but we're just trying to get our feet wet to help us relieve this paper burden. Um, automated, again, automated records retention. I kind of walked through that example, how it automates itself. Um, and it integrates with, across all our different platforms. Uh, Laserfish, what we found is the gold standard out there. Other entities using it, the county, city of Brunton, city of Paulsbo just went to it. Um, it is the gold standard for terms of records management and workflow processes development. Um, so this honeycomb looking chart here uh, kind of gets at the integration piece. So LaserFish will integrate with our current software and code. Uh, for finance, it'll integrate with our smart code planning software. It can you know, integrate with our course software, our public works GIS software, um, all our Microsoft Office products. So when uh, Sharon said, hey, this is Microsoft Office, this is how we do this, it'll interface with that and create a public record system for that piece as well. Um, so I've noted that, how that can help courts. Uh, the other piece that I heard today from Sharon was how they manage and monitor the workflow with the community service program. Again, this could be an e-form on our platform that they fill out, sign there, and flows all the way through. Again, right now we're paper handing off, losing in the band of us, getting back up to Sharon. A lot of uh, unproductive work. Uh, the last piece is I want to bring in the public benefit. Um, again, e-forms, you guys, I think, can see how the benefit of having electronic forms uh, will benefit the public. In particular, I had one good example I thought you guys would appreciate because we've talked about it several times. Um, yes, here it is. I want to describe what this practically looks like. Uh, we can get, if a customer doesn't e form for residential parking permits, uh, again, we don't have a parking permit software, we've talked about this before, uh, does the application online, the system will automatically store the application within the program, identify its appropriate retention schedule, put a timer on it for destruc destruction without involving any people or paper, and this means that the city isn't storing this record in a box, in an attic, and when someone, come, someone requests it, comes in, we don't have to go up to the clock tower to find it. So that's a real example I hope you guys can appreciate because we've talked about a parking permit system. Now this thing doesn't do all this thing, but it does a step better, a step better for the public. It also gives, again, the public access, as Mayor pointed out, for those documents we are ready to release to the public, just let them search it. Don't have them put in the public records request, put it on the website for public records link where it's all text searchable. 
So right now, we only store on our website, I believe just the last year and a half to two years of our ordinance minutes resolutions and the packets, those type of things. This will have the ability, um, if I understand it correctly, it'll be almost like a third vendor you want to do a public record search. Um, most jurisdictions already have it on their website. It'll bring you to a portal to where you can search your own records. You can put all the contracts, all the ordinance, all the minutes, whatever we see most common. We can put it out there. It's searchable right now. When you search for documents, it's only searching the, what we index it, which is the title of the document, not documents, not words housed in the document. So this will uh, eliminate that. And will this include past resolutions and ordinances? Absolutely. And I'll have everything that I have. And will this be word searchable? Yes. yes. Uh, yep. Uh, so I'm going to make a push to get this sooner than later because a it touches every department. It creates efficiencies in every department. Um, You've heard about the 4.5 million emails. That makes a huge impact to Brandon's department. Um, it makes a huge difference to me as I'm trying to plan to go accounts payable, uh, paperless, and all our other processes. Um, to actually having an invoice in an electronic format where when someone wants it, wants it, they can just search it and pull it up, and there it is. Rather than having to contact us, me send my AP clerk out to the box in the tower, pull the invoice for what purpose we don't know. It might be just to see the date. Uh, incredibly used to waste of time. The other push um, is, as you guys have read headlines, um, there is a collective group of people in Washington that look for when cities make mistakes and don't deliver documents to them, and then they end up suing them. And it ends up costing the cities hundreds of thousands of dollars. These are real cases, real things, and it's really unfortunate. Um, so this is a program that helps us to reduce that risk. Um, the benefit of going sooner than later is that we don't continue to build the pile of paper. We, Put a moment in line, uh, line in the sense that, hey, going forward, we're now going to be electronic all these fronts and we're going to try to capture all the stuff that was back there. Also allows us, as time moves forward, some of those stuff that is really old and records retention, maybe we don't get to it right away, but then it's destroyed, so we don't need to worry about it. So there's a risk element. You've heard about the spacing needs. I don't know if you've been into the public works department, but they have a whole room of files, paper files, that I believe you get them in the system scanned in. We now have a whole I don't know how big that room is, Mark. That you have six employees in there stacked on top of each other. Okay, so that's just the public works department. I know we have several Two rooms of also that are just completely paper. And if you've been up to the attic with the mayor's tour, you've seen all the paper files we have up there. It's incredible how much space and storage we're just using for paper and boxes. Plus, uh, plus the loft, the shop that nobody's ever seen. Oh, there you go. Another, another spot. That and all of that ties into the draft. Uh, records management policy that is being floated around and incorporates, which is vital to this piece, and the state's already recognized that and has implemented a scan and cost program. So that's that's the purpose of this, is to get those out of the clock tower into an electronic database of some sort and continue and routinely disposing or archiving vital records. So, for scanning all this, as we just talked about with all the paper that we have, is this something that would we would contract for a scanner, or we'll just be done we have. Uh, we, we're right now, we're that that the annex, out of the annex, the, the, the loft, mm -hmm. we, we, it's what it was about, $30,000? $20,000, yeah. $20,000. We're, we're capturing all of the, that documents. This is the tool right. to manage those documents so that we're not. So it's not, it's not going to be years to get this process integrated. We're no, and that's why I say sooner is better, yeah. because the sooner we get it, the sooner we'll stop having to collect stuff and then have to scan it. Right. We're going to hit it at the first point of contact. Right. Right. Or we'll collect the electronic records right. right. from having to go back and fix it. Okay. And so we've yeah. talked about how much scanning do we really, once we have it up and rolling, how much do you want to go back? Well, you start from the earliest and kind of work your way back, but we might find that by the time we get in those outer years, those documents are already past their uh, destruction schedule, so we don't need to worry about this. So it's, getting, it's about stopping stopping the build-up now and get in front of this thing. Um, and yes, we have contracted out for scanning for our GAS work to have all our as-builds bid in, um, but that's a very focused effort. It doesn't touch the rest of the city. That effort doesn't. In most departments, um, DCD, um, Public Works, the clerk's office, and finance, a couple of years ago already made that initiative that as things come in, we're automatically scanning them. We're not sure what we're going to do with them, but because we haven't implemented the scan and cost program, we can't dispose the record. So we have, um, like the permits, I know that DCD has probably, I know more than 50%, I'm not quite sure how much, already scanned in. Most of our records, the clerk's office, 
95 percent has already been scanned and we've been doing that for years and then dcd or excuse me public works at some point they said hey we're going to start scanning these it's the backlog which is what he talked about our maps we don't have and we have after disclosure that says i want anything and everything like sydney sydney including your utility maps and all of those so you have to go upstairs and say okay which portion of those maps are sydney so this that's going to clean up some of that work and again put it into the system yeah. Now, I want you to think about this more than just a records management system, because I, what I really appreciate about the demo was the workflow process mm -hmm. improvements. Staff efficiencies. Staff efficiencies, not running around, that the system is pushing this document through, and it's not on us to deliver it through email or some other channel or hand it enough. The efficiencies will be great. Uh, the other piece I think you guys will appreciate, of course, I've looked at the cost of this. And so, since the chief went first, I appreciate his giant number because ours is much better. And I say ours as a city, because again, this is going to touch every department. So it's not just the general fund, this impacts our enterprise funds. So the cost of this product does, can be shared amongst all our funds. Great news for us. Um, efficiency will be gained in every department. Um, so the, the bid I have is $170,000 for year one. But that includes the new software product, uh, you know, the implementation, the services. In year two through four, that drops down to forty thousand dollars. So now you're just maintaining the services and the servers. So I want you to hold that forty thousand number more than one hundred seventy. I've solved one hundred seventy thousand uh, deficit by, if you recall, I have not hired an employee for almost a year. I would let, propose to use those savings to purchase this program and other savings from other departments. Where do you spend those? <laughs> <laughs> you saw Steve Brad. You said Nick said it's not mine. <laughs> um, uh, so that's one piece of, I think, uh, of where the funding would come from, the savings and efficiencies uh, in my department and clerks and some of the other departments, as well as it's going to be shared amongst all the departments, all the funds. So from a funding perspective, I'm not concerned. The other piece I want you to hear is the $40,000 going forward. Uh, as Brandy pointed out before, if this continues to build up, she's looking at a part-time to full-time employee, right, that we would have to hire to help us just keep up with compliance. So forty thousand dollars is a lot cheaper than eighty thousand dollar employee with benefits going forward. Mm -hmm. So I want to keep those kind of thoughts in mind. When you say servers, you mean like cloud-based servers? Cloud-based servers, yeah. So I'm having Steve evaluate that to whether we want to host it on our server or go to their cloud-based server. Um, part of it is the cost-benefit analysis. Um, part of it is the efficiencies you gain when it is on the cloud and they're doing the updates routinely, so you're not have to worry about that, manage that. Um, so right now, it's just quote, have Steve look into what makes the best sense for the city. Do you think they're using AWS or Amazon Web Services? Or AWS? AWS. Do you think Blazor features subcontracted with accounts? That's a cloud service. That's I think. We got one. Yeah, I know. But I would encourage you to go on Blazor Fisher's website and poke around. I think you guys will actually be really impressed with what it can do. Um, and it may not mean as much to you guys as it really does to us who are on the operational side. Because we see how this really can impact our day-to-day -day work. Yeah. Rebecca, who's extremely conservative after she went to prison, she wouldn't stop talking about it for two days. We can't afford not to do this. We can't do this. We can So we're at 1 o'clock. That's the end of our time. We had a lot of for presentations. I'm sorry, I'm not going to make a mark. You're, you're out. I'm good. You got lunch. You got lunch. No. Uh, so we just be mindful of that. At least this has all been great information. Uh, and uh, we've got any questions for, for Noah. I hope I'm, you're I'm not done. You're not done? Oh, what? Look, you yeah. signed yeah. me a lot, Rob. Okay. No, this is actually a perfect time, perfect leading, because we're going to talk about the <laughs> well, What happened? Ten minutes. Well, you might never
PRC Vision 2050 in the planning department will be leading all charging comp plans. But we'll have work going through 2020 with PRC. PRC 2050 planning goes through 2023. And then the city of Orchard picks up a refresher of its comp plan beginning in 2022 and completed by 2024. What's important that, as you see in the next slide, the work we're doing now, the sewer comp plan, or excuse me, the water comp plan, uh, creating a stormwater comp plan, uh, it's developing a parks comp plan, uh, we work on transportation, with the transportation committee, and a facilities comp plan, all funneled into the overall city for orchard comp plan, which begins in 2022. <coughs> Moving ahead, that I have identified for you guys uh, all the sewer projects that are identified in the comp plan and the current estimate of projects. So you see in 2020, we're going to be working on marine pump station design, getting it ad ready for 2021. Uh, Bay Street Pump Station improvements are kicked out to 2023. Uh, we are hopefully going to be completing the former, uh, pump station number two. We've already completed uh, the design phase in 2018. Uh, so 2020, we're really focused on marine pump station, getting ad ready, McCormick Pump Station 2, and ensuring that McCormick Pump Station 1 is completed. Looking forward in the 21-22 budget, which we'll talk later in months, and we're refunding the marine pump station, finding hopefully better information for final costs are going to be uh, for construction as well as field press station. On the sewer projects, um, the important ones to highlight here again are well led. Uh, this is a project that we are committed to now with our developer agreements. Um, so we're going to be moving forward with that in 2020 and 2021 as well as um, monitoring the well 12 pilot hole, make sure that's going forward. And of course we're currently under, I don't know if it's under construction, but we'll call it under construction for well 13. Uh, getting closely monitor that as costs continue to come in and hopefully our funding sources match that, but uh, things to be aware of. If you flip to the next piece, stormwater comp plan. What we decided in the <coughs> 1920 budget was that since we did not have a good comp plan, we had a bunch of stormwater capital projects, but we weren't really sure how to fit in. We committed with the public works department to work on the comp plan to come up with a good stormwater comp plan that identified the capital uh, improvement projects that we would be going forward with, along with our complete streets. So we're continuing that body of work. Uh, flipping over to the Parks and Facilities project timelines, um, upcoming this summer, we're going to be working on the Memorial Splash Pad retrofit. Again, this is a part of our uh, development agreement uh, for water. Um, we also have City Hall. I have a long timeline on that because right now we're going to design, we're, coming, we're in the early phases of what that looks like. Um, so, it's going to be a few years out as we continue to talk about that. And uh, I also have on here the community center. Very important point, uh, taking up staff resources in the mayor's time, all the work with the PFD uh, to do that. Last but not least, the transportation projects timeline. Uh, we've, quote, completed Fremont from a construction standpoint. We're still in the closeout phase, so we've got uh, staff working on that, but for all intents and purposes, we feel like it's fairly complete. Um, we got Bay Street right away acquisition coming, and then for 2020, we don't have any other major capital projects for transportation. Now, I think that's okay. I think that's great, in fact, because of all the other projects we have going on, and sometimes we need a breather to really regroup and figure out what's going on. It also gives us the opportunity to focus on our transportation committee, send priorities, mission, visions, all those kind of things, as well as focusing on our annual meeting um, preservation program. And we're still developing plans and specs for those two complete overlay projects. One is uh, Sydney from Cedric headed south, and the other is Liberty Street. And, and uh, we won't know if we've got enough money to pay both of those and throw the lot of bid for being bid, you know, as a package or as bid alternates to select one if, if anyone price comes in. I just want to remind the council that the transportation project timeline here reflects our six year tip. And so if you go to that document, you go here, they should go on. Um, which that means is that in 21 and 22, you see we have a lot of projects that we're planning. It's just a lot of yellow out there, so we'll continue to talk about that over the next couple months with the transportation community. Uh, lastly, I have a, a, a whole holistic snapshot of all the projects from, from this current by 1920, as well as 21 and 22, looking forward. So you've got one place to go, look and see all the capital projects that we are planning and working on. So there's really two full uh, topics I think hopefully you heard from me today. Is this piece is really on the capital side. Everything we force focus on us operationally. Uh, we need to invest in ourselves as well as invest in capital projects. Yeah, so we're putting forth 
uh, these proposals so you guys hopefully uh, support what we're doing in the city. Um, I'm going to continue to push this message in the budget process until you guys tell me to stop. Uh, but again, to focus on our current comp plan and prioritize our resources for those projects, uh, which means no new projects. Um, again, we'll put forth a 21-20 budget that focuses on those efforts only. Um, and that's going to be really important when we come to the water and sewer capital funding because we will have to have some difficult discussions about how much capital funding we have available for those projects, as well as transportation. Uh, so no new projects. Again, we will continue to maintain a list of projects that will carry us forward. Uh, we also call it the Mayor's Project List. Uh, and Steve will continue, City staff will continue to report and work with the Mayor, as well as the Council on our capital projects, our successes, and our setbacks. And with that, I think this is a good transition to hand it over to Nick. So we can talk about something. Quick questions about the, I mean, the, the lot of stuff on this. Just a quick question. We really don't expect any additional funds out of this legislative session, do we? You know, it's not realistic. Yeah. Okay. 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 Right. 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 I'm going to ask a couple of bills. Right. Um, one's about mm -hmm. complex realignment dates. Um, there really isn't any money to be had, right. I, I don't believe, in this session. Okay. okay. incredibly talented. They do a lot with a little. Um, they're independent. They're self-starters. They don't require uh, a ton of my attention. They come to me when they have issues, but SmartGov really helps manage the workflow so that I can roll up my sleeves and actually help out with a lot of the work volume. So I'm passing out right now um, a couple of things. There's the PowerPoint presentation and uh, and chart that shows our, our timeline of projects over the coming two year period. And then there's also the list of the map showing the location of all of our current projects, which is kind of alarming. I think the total number of units there is 4,300 uh, residential units, and that's, uh, and of course, the number of commercial projects, which are, are more different, difficult to uh, quantify in terms of their impact on the department. So, um, jumping into the presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, the work that our department does in the regional planning context, our long-range planning projects, short-range planning, code enforcement, and the building department. On page three of the presentation, this is a graphic that I took from PSRC that kind of shows the regulatory con context in which we work, uh, which is Growth Management Act, that uh, informs everything that we, we do in the planning department. Vision 2050, which is nearing adoption uh, at PSRC, I think it's supposed to be adopted in April, and we have previously commented on that through the, the adoption process over the last two years. Um, that sets the multi-county planning policies, which then come to the KRCC, where we adopt our regional, uh, our county-wide planning policies, and then, of course, we adopt our uh, local comprehensive plans from there. And there could be another hexagon there that, that shows development regulations and budget where we actually implement uh, these policies that ultimately flow from the state to the regional level, to the county level, and down to the city. Page four, um, uh, a lot of what is in this presentation is a, is a result of the trend that is occurring throughout the region. Um, the, the Vision 2050 plan is planning for 1.8 uh, million more people um, between 2017 and 2050. And so we're getting uh, our share of that certainly, and um, you know, all the cities in the region are dealing with a lot of the same challenges that we are. Uh, we have annexed a lot of areas over the last decade. I think we, our challenges are, um, are different because of how much land we have relative to how few residents we have and how much development activity is going on and is possible in our city at this time. 
Um, in terms of regional planning, I mentioned that uh, the vision is scheduled for adoption soon. We're, we're about 50% of the way through our comp plan periodic update cycle. We adopted our comp plan in 2016. The next one has to be adopted in 2024. So we're at the midway point, and this is where the work at the regional level is, is happening, and then in two years we're going to start our comprehensive plan update process. We are also currently, and I'm working with SOFI uh, and Triangle through KRCC on countywide planning policies. We've, we've updated one of the elements of the countywide planning policies where we are kind of finalizing that and getting it ready for ratification. There's going to be a second phase of work on the countywide planning policies where we, we've proposed and I believe it's agreed that we're going to hire a consultant uh, that is going to go through and do a gap analysis looking at the new vision, state law, and making sure that the countywide planning policies are updated and consistent before we move forward with our, our comprehensive plans. Now going to uh, population and employment numbers, if you remember in 2016 we were uh, allocated 8,235 residents that we had to plan for between uh, 2010 and 2036 and we had a plan for 3,132 uh, jobs. We have consistently hit our share on a, on a per year basis. We're, we're bringing in about two to 300 uh, residents, and I think 2019 when we see the OFM numbers is actually gonna be higher due to the number of housing starts that we uh, have had recently. But we are right on track in terms of uh, pulling our weight uh, in, in terms of growth performance. When we do the 2024 comprehensive plan, uh, we are going to be given a new allocation that will be from 2024 through 2044, so it's a 20 year planning target. And I believe that we're looking at anywhere uh, between 8 and 12,000 more residents that we have to plan for for that 20 year period, and probably three to 5,000 jobs. And that's going to be worked out at the countywide level. And if you were at the, the retreat with uh, the KRCC retreat, you heard that. Bainbridge doesn't want a lot of that growth, and they would like Fort Orchard to take uh, more than it has historically. And so there's going to be some pressure uh, for growth to go to the south end, and that's, that's of course, challenging for us because of our infrastructure uh, needs and all of the capital projects that Noah has identified, which are just the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, what is needed to, to support this level of, of growth. Is that 15 miles including the 8 to no, it's, it's, it's going to be a new number from that point forward. Okay, because I know when we've talked, we've talked for Vision 2050, we've talked about 15,000 for us in our UGA. I, I, the UGA application will be an additional number from that new task. So it's probably eight for the city and six for the UGA, and it could be higher if Bainbridge takes less of that growth. But I don't believe it's, it's not adding 15 on top of the 8. Our new number is 15, where the previous year was 8. Is that true? No, our previous number was 8. We're going to have grown by about 3,000 to 4,000 over the 8 year period, and we're going to get a new 8,000 people we have to plan for. Okay, so it's still 8,000 people. But and, that's, and that has nothing to do with expanding the UGA or annexing. Yeah. But it's not, it's not compiling it on top of. It's a, it's a new number we're growing for from that day forward to the next planning period. Correct. Right, and it's separate from the numbers we've been talking about, the 20, that we did the exercise at the retreat on. Uh, what do you mean, separate? I, I think this is the number that we talked about at the retreat. Right, but this is going out to 2015, and you're talking about. Correct, we only go out 20 years in our plan, so it's prorated for that first period of time. Okay. And then I'll, I'll be interested to hear more about Bainbridge Island's push to keep population out of their island city at some point. Well, and the feeling that I have is that they're willing to take some growth in Kings or in uh, Winslow. Winslow. And, um, but they really don't want growth in other parts of the island, and they're feeling like 4,000 people is about what they want to see in Winslow, which is their proportionate share is closer to 8,000 as well. So they're looking to push some of that off on other jurisdictions. Well, the market forces are going to determine the quantity of the market instead of acres. Sure, right. So, yeah, anyway, we're, we're planning. It, you're right. The market is going to determine. And if these numbers run through, we'll lose our seat at PSRC. That's okay. Um, because we won't have a job surplus. You know, if we grow by 8,000 people and 3,000 jobs, we have 2,000 more jobs than workers right now. Um, we'll be closer to balance. But who knows what's. 
I, I think the county, we know the county campus is growing. That's going to create jobs. Um, it's, many of these factors are beyond our control, but it's a planning exercise. And if you're paying down this whole decade, then their, their market will change to, well, should change to the You should. You've got to look at more authority. Yes. Yes. All right, so um, moving on to uh, slide number six, long-range planning. Um, at the present time, we are managing more long-range planning projects than we've ever had at one time in our history. Long-range planning is handled by our long-range planner, Carrie and I, and we, we did hire an intern recently who's helping us a little bit here and there with these projects, but it's, it's really a two-person show, and uh, you know we are, we are really feeling the pressure to get a lot of things done, and some of these have very firm deadlines. Other things are somewhat more flexible, and we're going to do our, the best we can to manage this over the next year. Just to touch on a few, we'll have our annual comp plan amendment process. We have a 2021, a July 2021 deadline to update our shoreline master program regulations. We just signed a contract Tuesday for the downtown sub area plan and planned action EIS, and that's got to be done by a year, a little past a year from now, I think. The contract ends with the Department of Commerce on April 1st. Realistically, we've got to be done with most of the work by December in order to send it forward for formal adoption in the spring. The Ruby Creek sub-area plan, which I know uh, I've heard from Council Member Chang at least that we don't love that name. I'm both still open to suggestions for what to call that area uh, there at Sydney and Sedgwick. Um, we are doing quite a bit on the, that planning exercise. We, we have some graphic work being done by our intern and we have a small contract uh, to have some site planning exercises uh, uh, prepared by Makers Architecture and we're just going out for public outreach to the residents of the apartments out there and to the landowners uh, in that area. We have had quite a few meetings with developers in that area. Rush at the corner of Sydney and Cedric still owns that empty pad and they're looking at about a 50 unit uh, development with some good workspace. Um, and there's a 222 unit apartment project proposed at the intersection of Hubby, which you would see on your map. And that is, uh, we have water and sewer challenges that are, are very real in that area. Where's that By the bridge, by the bridge, should lay on that path that oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's on the property. The cooler yeah. property target. Um, in addition, we're kicking off our parks plan next Tuesday, and the consultant, our, our hope is that he really takes leadership on that so that that doesn't become a management issue for our department so much as the consultant is taking the lead. Um, and we expect that to be done by the summer. Um, we're coordinating with all the water system planning efforts, uh, sewer system plans, stormwater plans that Mark's department is is either in the middle of or just getting started on. And where we get into that is we have to make land use projections for what growth we know about, what growth we expect, uh, the land capacity of those areas, and really make sure that they're sizing uh, they're modeling and sizing things correctly for what growth is anticipated. So we're getting close on the water plan. I think that'll be done by this summer. Um, and uh, obviously the stormwater plan, as we mentioned, is just getting started. Um, as part of the 2024 comp plan process, we have to do an updated buildable lands analysis. This is something that we work with the county on, uh, and it's, it's pretty resource intensive. We can either do it in-house and hire our own consultant, or last time we paid the county through an interlocal agreement to do that analysis for us. It's about $15,000 worth of work. Um, and we may, because we went to a form-based code, it's going to be a more challenging exercise next year because we aren't density-based in our development regulations. We have to make some assumptions and figure out how to, to do that analysis, and so we may end up doing that ourselves. Uh, this time around. We're also continuing with the appeal that we filed of the county comp plan. There's the transportation implementation strategy that we, uh, the mayor and council member Ashby uh, attended uh, just a week and a half ago. So we're, we're still participating in that plan development. We also found out the county is adopting county impact fees and we're very interested to see what projects they're putting on that study so that we make sure that developers are funding improvements in areas where we may annex in the future. And then lastly, uh, in a recent staff meeting actually talking about this retreat, uh, we discussed the need to update our city capital facilities plan, which will tie into our 2024 update. And that is likely something that would be a consultant exercise uh, going forward to bring in somebody and really do a comprehensive inventory of what we have, what we need, and really kind of organize all these the city hall projects, uh, uh, you know, public works stuff, and really get it into one document in anticipation of the 2024 um, 
The mayor touched on recent accomplishments, so I won't go, go into that. Uh, as far as development regulations, we are, uh, we are under contract. We're finishing up our traffic impact fee study. Um, and as part of the parks plan, we're actually going to be adopt, we're going to be calculating a new parks impact fee. Um, the traffic fee is, is somewhat hung up depending on how negotiations with McCormick go because there's still this whole Gen 1 reimbursement issue and we still expect to complete that this year, but we need to have some conversations with the developers in, in uh, conjunction with that project. We also, uh, last year we were working on the multi-family tax exemption ordinance. Um, that is ready to go to one of the committees. We are waiting for committees so that we can schedule that uh, going forward into this year. I don't know whether finance or economic development or land use ought to be the, the group that discusses that, but uh, I'll, I'll get with the, the chairs of each of those committees and see who wants to, to have that come to their meeting. Um, the mayor mentioned a temporary signs in the right-of-way issue. And the Ninth Circuit Court actually, after they, after the Supreme Court made the re-ruling about content neutrality, the Ninth Circuit issued a new ruling about two years ago that said cities can regulate on the basis of commercial speech, which is different from protected <coughs> speech. So if we want to go down the road of revisiting our temporary signs in the right of way and having code enforcement enforce that, um, that's something that we could do, but it's, we've got to squeeze it into our, uh, our agenda this year. Junk, the junk, I mean, you see them, the advertisement signs that look the size of a political sign and they're stuck all over in the right of way. Yeah. We we previously learned, thought we couldn't regulate that. Now we've learned we can regulate it. Um, you know, it's not going to be the biggest priority for kind of code enforcement, but at least public works or, or could, you know, as they're about, out and about, could, could pick those up um, if we change our code. I, th um, I think they're, uh, you know, I think they pollute the Tremont in other places. We should probably just time that around the election season so that we're not making changes right in the middle of people figuring out their signs. But I think that uh, towards the end of this year, we should be looking to that. Um, additionally, significant trees and tree canopy is still an issue with the Planning Commission. We thought we were close to the finish line last September, but uh, that's gotten a little bit sideways because the different planning commissioners have different ideas about what they want and we're not all on the same page uh, in terms of what our purpose is. So we're kind of taking a step back and we're going to try to bring that forward again this year, but it's uh, it's been more contentious uh, than we expected and uh, we're, we're working on it. Finally, um, with all the erosion control issues we've had at a couple of sites, Stetson Heights and uh, Blueberry specifically, uh, the Department of Ecology had a, a meeting with, with us to try to better understand our processes. They have made some recommendations for process and code changes that they think we ought to make to, to better protect ourselves from these types of things happening in the future. And so there is some pressure to revisit the, the stormwater drainage permit and land disturbing activity permit chapters next year and are in this coming year. And so uh, that's a joint public works and planning effort. But as far as timing, we really don't. We, we've got to find some time to squeeze that in, but it's a pretty major uh, project. Uh, finally, the mayor also had asked that I have a discussion of building per the building department specifically because we, we operate with one building inspector. I've included four charts on slides eight and nine. Um, first of all, we, despite the moratorium, we had 192 housing starts in 2019, which is far above anything we've done in the last five years. Um, if you look at inspection volumes per year, they are far above anything we've done in past years. And actually, our in-house inspector is doing more uh, compared to Code Pros, our consultant inspector, which is down actually from previous years' work, despite the overall load being higher. That's actually been related to uh, some injuries and sick leave issues with our, our inspector. Um, the other issues in the building department that are going on right now, um, you have to adopt new building codes by June 30th of this summer. And that's the, the 2018 IDC is finally ready for adoption. We also, with the courthouse, the community event center, uh, potential city hall improvements, and if we have these mixed use projects downtown, it is likely we're going to need to hire a special inspector specific to those projects. And if you remember last year, we adjusted our building permit fees to make sure that those high value projects would bring in enough revenue to cover those costs. And so that is a consultant selection that we need to do this year. But in terms of staffing, um, 
I was told just a couple of days ago that our building, our building inspector is now contemplating retirement sooner than he had planned. Um, that is uh, obviously concerning, and, and one of the things I've learned is that our building inspector sometimes does 30 inspections in a single day. The industry average is 10 to 12, uh, sometimes as high as 17 if, if things are in close proximity. But we're getting a lot out of our inspector because he has a lot of knowledge and he's, he's able to get to things. He probably also uh, is a little quick to fail people if, they, if they're five minutes late or uh, <laughs> if, if something's out of work, he, just, he says, no, it failed and takes off, which maybe is, is a little lacking on, uh, on uh, service, but gets the volume that we need uh, in terms of inspections. But, you know, we did 3,600 inspections. My name <laughs> we did uh, 3,600 inspections last year, which is an average of 12 per day, uh, and that's not including a lead, uh, paid leave type things. He's also doing plan reviews, which um, with the moratorium, he actually had no plan reviews for a series of months, and he was doing nothing but inspections. So if you look at the volume over the last few years, it's, it's extremely high. In 2015 and 2016, I, I included a chart showing our, our consulting costs for code pros compared to what percentage of our inspector was out on, on leave. Um, he, there were some medical issues in 2015 and 2016, um, which caused code pros to spike, but I don't think volumes were significantly different. In 2017, we had a period where we had a lot of applications coming at once and we were having eight week review times and so we paid the consultant to actually do expedited reviews to try to get through our backload and so we had quite a bit of cost just in plan review in 2017. But in 2018 and 2019, it really has been inspection volumes related to uh, the projects that we have because we've been keeping up with plan reviews uh, a little better over the last two years. And what that shows, and I, I included the $50,000 that we paid our fire marshal and, um, and looking at code pros at 17500 in 2019, but we spent over 30000 in 2017, you know, we're spending a pretty uh, sizable share of what an FTE would cost to potentially give us those same level of services. And we also, when we get to the project now, you're going to see how many projects are coming in. And I think uh, we need to have a very real conversation as part of our staffing needs analysis, which uh, HR is going to be doing. But we need to look functionally at how our building department operates. We don't actually have a certified building official on staff. We, Code Pros has a building official that we can use, but um, we don't have that skill in house. Uh, and the fire marshal is its, its own issue, and it actually potentially could relate to this issue of uh, fire flow stacking versus nested storage that we have. And so I think there's a, a very important conversation that needs to be had about our, the future of our building department and with a potential retirement in the next year or so, um, th this is the time that we need to be having that conversation. Um, going on to code enforcement, uh, you know, Doug actually took some carpentry classes and for a while was helping us with inspections, but with the erosion control issues at Stetson Heights, uh, he has been uh, too busy to even really help out on the building side of things. Our priorities are still to abate one to two dangerous buildings annually, and we've got a special emphasis where we're dealing with code enforcement at nearly every property on proper road, which has been a perpetual problem for the city. Uh, Stetson Heights and Blueberry are uh, a mess right now, and we are working with the Department of Ecology to clean those areas up. Uh, I mentioned the temporary signs in the right of way, which if we pass a change, that would increase Doug's uh, you know, patrolling and going and picking up signs and pulling them and storing them. Uh, and then there's quite a few code updates related to code enforcement that are still needed. Nuisances, the chapter that actually gives our code enforcement uh, officer the authority to issue citations, there's provisions that are needed there. Uh, and then our uh, Jennifer Robertson, when we uh, asked her to handle a couple of land use issues, she pointed out that we really need a catch-all enforcement chapter in Title 20 that includes Scott work orders and what our process is for pumping the brakes on a project when they have problems like We've seen Stetson Heights and Blueberry and, and really ensuring that we have due process protections. And so that is something that I've asked Doug to uh, include in his uh, work plan for the next two years to, to address. So just to summarize, um, that's, uh, I guess that doesn't really look like me. It looks more like Dick Brown uh, that's drowning on page 11. But uh, the, uh, our department's handling this. Okay, <laughs> Our department is handling six major projects right now for long-range planning. Our permit activities at record levels, 
We're still dealing with McCormick Woods, which is a, a huge amount of time just to negotiate and work, work to hammer out these development agreements. The community center, the community event center that we're planning was not really something that I anticipated in last year's work plan, and managing that contract to the consultant and keeping that going in the right direction. Um, there's a couple of ways we can do that. Either the consultant we hire can, can designate a project manager that is separate from the, the design team manager that will help kind of shepherd this thing through the process. Alternatively, the city could look at bringing on its own independent consultant who manages that project and is paid for out of the, the funds that we have, which would ensure that, that I'm not having to spend a quarter of my time trying to, to make that project um, go forward. We're actually we're issuing a contemplates them having you know, the team bringing forward the project manager. It does, it does. And I wanted to just point that out to the city council in case you feel that there's value to having somebody independent as opposed to having it all under one contract. I think there's there's pros and cons to, to either approach. I guess it would be a, that it's an important conversation because I'm taking it to the PFD Monday for just keep them in the loop. I don't need their blessing and I want to bring it to you guys Tuesday night. Why would you bring it to the PFD before the council session? Because they need once a month. And I don't have to, I don't need their, it's just informational. This is this is the draft of the RFP we're getting ready to issue. I'm, I'm not on their agenda. I'm going in the public comment period just to brief them that we're not sitting on our hands. We are moving on to issues related to it. I want to show them. I have to reference it. I just don't think that's right. It's a real chance to look at it. It is draft. It, it's not, I'm not, I'm not asking for their approval. Why would you just sit there and say, this is a time on the issue of the RFP or something like that? Maybe discuss the worst that anybody wants to come from the audience. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, the other major issue, I mean, the, the site management at Blueberry Ridge in Stetson is sucking a lot of time from a lot of my staff who are having to go out and inspect, uh, deal with erosion control issues. We're trying to initiate enforcement. We've had multiple meetings with the Department of Ecology, but just, um, you know, unfortunately, I, I feel like a couple of bad developers are, are going to kind of ruin things for the good developers because you, we can't, we can't, uh, we either have to, we have to plan for the worst case scenario. And, um, and I think that's going to end up frustrating a lot of people in our community. Um, either that or we're, we're going to have a, uh, a weaker response in these places in the future. So that's, that's part of this discussion on stormwater and landscape activity permits, uh, chapter updates that we have coming next year. Um, so finally, I mentioned the 4,300 housing units. I provided a map. It's, uh, there's so many projects we have breaking into actually three pages this year, and uh, so that you can really zoom in on different areas of the city. The couple of things that I really want to touch on, um, we're going we're gonna to see ground broken at McCormick North any day for the first 88 homes off of Piggly Road there, and uh, I believe at this point the quadrant is closed on that with McCormick communities uh, to build those homes. One of the, the smaller projects that we have to also deal with this year is Quadrant has identified a few minor issues in the design standards that they'd like us to, to talk about, um, and so we're going to take those to the planning commission here soon. Um, additionally, McCormick West, I just got the call from their engineer that they are designing their first phase in McCormick West, and that's because they have to, as part of the water system improvements at the Well 12 campus, they're going to be extending a transmission main through McCormick West, and as long as they're putting in road grades, they want to go ahead and take advantage of that cost and work on the first phase of the project there. So um, I think we're going to see groundbreaking there in the next year. Um, they have submitted a preliminary plat on parcel A at McCormick, which is right at the corner of the entrance of McCormick Woods. And I will tell you, the, uh, the biggest concern that I hear from people in McCormick Woods is about the loss of the trees in that very area. Uh, no, I think that this is a new preliminary plat as opposed to something that's covered under their development agreements. And so this is going to be one of the more contentious projects that we've ever seen uh, in our city. And that's probably going to go to hearing in the middle of this year. That's the corner of Woods West. Parcel A. It's right at the end. It's showing which map we're going to see. So the front is number map three, uh, project number 46. That's it. And they don't have a, no, they don't have a, yeah. 
they're going to have to go through hearing examiner. So you're going to have a shift. No, it's a new class application. That was all the way through the track. It's never been done. It's never been done. It's never been done. It's never been done. Anyway, other projects on Map 2. I mentioned the big apartment development project 38 on Sydney and then the Rush project 39. Those are, I think 38 is in a feasibility period right now and they've got some pretty advanced design about what they want to do there. I think that's actually up to 122 units. But there are sewer capacity and water capacity issues that require developer improvements or it's going to be put on hold until the city builds. 37 also is the Glenmora project. Yeah, and then 37, Glenmora is working with Roman and Roman and we're probably 60% of the way through the roundabout design at Cedric, which is paid for privately. And so that getting approval to build that roundabout is a condition of the purchase and sale that they have for parcel 37 to actually sell that for a massive apartment project. 500 units. And probably it's going to connect in some way through the Bethel and Geiger as well. So they'll have the back side of Bethel. They're right in right there on the back there. That's a local traffic. Yeah. Project 16 on the map, on the same map, is Blueberry Ridge where we're having a lot of issues right now. And next week we're having a hearing on Project 23, which is the Geiger plot for 50 additional lots. 16, that's not... That's the preliminary grading that's going on right now. Right, it's not the... Endazio? Endazio. Correct. That's the photo. Right, but that's fully built up. Right. Is there a revocation process for approvals on the Geiger plan? That's probably a good question for Charlotte. I think that there is revocation of permits in the event that they're not following conditions like erosion of the road issues. The other two big projects, 35 and 36, just to the east of Fred Meyer, are appear to be going forward in there. You know, there's between the two of them, there's about 174 units. I think it's combined, and I see that she duplicated the number rather than separating them up. But I don't think they're far enough along to have an accurate count. But it's certainly over 100 units, well over 100 units on those two sites. The last thing I wanted to point out is, you know, we talked about when we fund all of our improvements and we're doing the traffic impact fee study update. I think since we did that traffic impact fee study in 2015, construction costs are probably 20 or so percent higher, far above inflation. If we adjust our construction costs for inflation and add the Bethel project as it's now defined in that fee, I think you're going to see a traffic impact fee calculation that's potentially around $4,000 unless you choose to remove projects from that list. Right now we're at $2,500 per single family house, but we've got 4,300 units here. That's roughly $11.5 million in traffic impact fees, and if it goes to increase up to about $4,000, it's about $17 million in traffic impact fees. And our total project list is still $100 million in projects that are on our tip. So just to keep that in the back of your mind as you're considering how much is happening, when it's happening, and what our needs are, you can harness the potential of all this development in a good economy, and we're a small stretch of tree lawns, $20 million, just to put it into perspective. Exactly. That was 50 million. Well, you know, it's interesting when you mention that, and once again, I don't know if anybody else got to see the Secretary's briefing to the Senate, but one of the issues that he raised to the Senate was that there's a lot of impacts that aren't captured in the impact fees to state highways. And he's introducing that, and when I look at that large apartment complex off the Bronx, Paris is a perfect example. You can look at the apartments in Sydney and Glenmore, and you can look at the apartments in Bronx, Paris. And 
us to fix it. And I only raise that because I would not at all be surprised if the state legislature doesn't come down with something that says local communities, you've got to contribute towards the solution. It's not that you're going to pay for it, but you need to at least contribute. And he cited a development in Spokane where they commented through the EIS on the need for a local funding program, about $65 million. The local community said, oh, no, we're not going to worry about it. They let the development go forward and build. Now the impact is on I-90 that the state is going to be asked to put in over $400 million to build an interchange to respond to the impact of this development that could have been dealt with at 65. So it's kind of two ways. I just raise it as the state is looking at these kinds of things and wanting to say, don't forget us. But it's a catch-22 because the SRC is saying you shall get $8,000 more and you shall. Agreed. And we only have a certain amount of bandwidth. So we can't, and if we were to deny it and tell the SRC we're not going to provide the land use to do it. We can't grant that. It's just a big catch-22. But remember, on Sedgwick, we included the two roundabouts that provide access to the local streets in our impact fee calculation, but we chose not to include Sedgwick between 16 and Bethel. So that's something that you can consider. If we're going to take some responsibility to at least collect the fees for that project, that can be baked into our impact fee study going forward. And it's roughly the same project that we did on Tremont in terms of length and intersections. It's a $23 million project. And we only have one chance to collect mitigation from the developers. I only raise it because you talked about the need to deal with traffic impact fees earlier. And then you show us all of these projects that are going to be impacted. And it just triggered Roger Millar's briefing to the Senate that don't forget us when you develop your impact fees. And we might get legislation that forces that. And I think if we don't, we're going to get legislation that forces that. That's right. Too much for affordable housing. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Let's take the time. I think we need to jump right into Mark's presentation. Maybe 10 minutes. I'm going to get us back on schedule. 7 o'clock. Yeah. 7 o'clock. Well, I'll be here. Let's take the time. 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 Let's take the time.
we had an electric issue, and before I came here, we hired a low throw line electric for everything in case go to do all our work. We now have an electrician, and that's the great news. The bad news is he can't take a vacation, he can't leave, because we're constantly having, because we've taken the electrician, not just managing all of our pump station controls, but also we've taken SCADA, that used to be with TSI, and he's overseeing that. So we're going to need a second electrician at some point, um, because we're taking ownership, and we get more and more infrastructure with you know, a new well, we get a new pump. It's a new electrical control system, new pump stations, new electrical control systems. So I'd say that's probably the biggest need uh, in the public works moving forward. Um, and the other thing I'd like to just mention, two things that came up today. Um, we talked about a PIO in the city being responsive, and I want to put a caveat on that, that in this particular case that brought up the most recent unrest, that was just for traffic control. So if you just had energy or wave cable or the county or anybody else had been down there, they wouldn't have done, they wouldn't have done a public notice because they weren't closing the road. They simply had traffic control. And so we need to be very careful in what policies we develop, what we develop as far as expectation. If it's going to be an expectation that the city's going to have to now go out and do some sort of noticing every time we're going to go run the street sweeper down or cut any vegetation, Things that we do all the time with just traffic control. Mark, that's not being sent at all. And well, I just talked about this yesterday. Okay, well, I'm just saying. Not being sent at all. We need, it's a slippery slope. Uh, the other thing is uh, the court's presentation on community service. That's all really great. It's great that they're saving that kind of money, but it's at a cost to our department because they're the ones that are shepherding these. And you have, but we find that they, we find an FTE that you have, so they go hand in hand. So we're still losing, we have a currently one of the the individual that's doing that. But we, we funded an FT. Uh, well, it, it's being utilized. <coughs> so I'm just saying, it isn't just community services, you know, it's a great program. There is a, an additional cost that wasn't presented, that's all I'm saying. And that's all I got. Any other questions? So we've got five minutes and 44 seconds. We yeah. have, all right. Where are we with the pavement management system? Um, what we're doing right now with the pavement management system is we now have Chris Hammer, which we place Mike Pleasance. He has experience in the city of Bainbridge where they do more of a uh, force account type spec where we're not having to survey and do a full set of plans. It's more of a unit based program. So he and Ian are working together on a few pavement projects to get that actually out on the street here in a couple months. Uh, so we'll get those paid this year, depending on what costs come in. But we're going to save money on the design side because he already has a template to do that more performance-based unit, mm -hmm. unit price. We're also going to have that section, because we have an on-call survey right now, we still are going to survey, because we have the budget from Sunset to South Pacific Boulevard on Harvard, so that we can get that survey in, and then Ian can be working, and Chris can be working on that. Uh, because that's, because that's a complete street. That's we're missing a second of sidewalk there, which mm -hmm. has to have some stormwater improvements. And, uh, and there's a water line that needs to get to replace right underneath it. So yeah, we have a water line that we wanted to upgrade while we're doing three months, but it's outside of repair potential effects and we couldn't touch it. So it kind of has a, a non standard termination. So, but we're going to get that survey done. As far as the pavement management system in general, and Chris for Bainbridge wrote their road safety plan. So we're taking, he's going to write our road safety plan and that'll give us access to funds. And we're going to combine the ADA transition plan, the payment management system, and this road safety plan in our tip. And then we'll have that documentation ready when the transportation committee or whatever we're calling it convenes and then we'll be working through that process. So it'll be a very uh, compre comprehensive presentation of all the documents that we have, so that they're being A more scientific approach. Remember, the pavement management system is really just a tool. It evaluated all of our streets and the sub rates. And it's one of the criteria we need to use as we decide what streets we're going to pay. Because just because it's, on the surface, the worst condition, right. isn't necessarily where we need to put our resources, because what's underneath there is part of the equation. 
what stormwater infrastructure or water line or other. So we need a coordination of our ADA transition plan and our pavement management system and our storm and sewer and water needs. And because the last thing we want to do is put a new sidewalk down and pave the street and come back next year and put a water, water, water line in. Right. You know, so is it, is it complete speed or just an overlay? So. Conversely, the worst thing we want to do is we're not going to pave the street until we get this all figured out. So for the next seven years, you're going to be driving through potholes. For the next seven years, you're probably, you're probably dealing with patches until we, because we're, if we overlay that street, we're, we're probably not going to fix the, the water line. We, all, all of these things need to be coordinated, is what I'm trying to say. Agreed. But at some point, we got to get something done, other than just we're starting things to death. So. Yeah, I, I hear you. I think we have quite a bit of time. So, maybe it's a matter of seeing some of those results that we have yet seen. The prioritization, whether that looked like. And to be honest, the tree lot was our. That was it. Yeah. I mean, we, did, we, we, we can't manage anymore. Well, remember the yeah. management assessment said that we need to do 1.5 million a year to yeah. stay even. We were we on the record for him, so every year we're behind this. And then we lost 200. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. 200. Yeah. So I was going to mention, Mark mentioned the very beginning of his presentation about this new reservoir by Fred Meyer that we need additional storage. And the reason we need that is because we're not allowed to nest our storage, which is the fire authority's requirement. They said that they were allowed nesting if we had fire sprinklers in all our houses. But it seems to me that we're going to need. Our water system costs are going to be extremely high unless we can get to a place where we're nested, which would either require us to change our fire authority code or potentially consider fire sprinklers as a savings to the city's water system by not having to build all this additional capacity to meet their. You know, I think we all know what it would look like in our council meeting if we were mandating sprinkler <laughs> systems. But, well, it's just. The building industry will be in the public interest. So just prepare yourself. Right. The building also, industry also says it has a $15,000 app and really it's a two, three. So it's some, some it, middle life. And it may come out of the state building codes in the next three years that this is going to be required statewide anyway, which would potentially solve this problem. But anyway, just move for thought on the water system funding issues. From a capacity issue, that's the versus staff. It's a huge. Now, one option that we have instead of building this 390 is that we could actually go in and put pump stations at each one of our reservoirs that allows us to use the entire volume rather than just the operational storage. So we're, we're, down, we're down to the weeds. Yeah, right. That's, that's just just and I, I believe this 390 thing will be solved by the uh, It's not going to be. The, the connection fees are the cost of any one of these improvements. So, and we're, so we're down to the weeds. Call this thing back and um, okay. other questions for Mark, not related to you know paving management system specific or now higher level stuff. Okay. This looks great for affordable housing. I would agree, and, and a lot of this is being driven on to us, not things we control. It also doesn't look great for our budget. <coughs> Something's got to go. Right. <coughs> Um, I know that NOAA will, by February, 
there's a particular, probably at that finance committee, committee meeting and then be reported out. We'll have 2019 screwed up. We'll know what. We you know, really had revenue, we really had expenses. I know we've spent a bit of it already because we, we, it, it's very good. We, we, we had rec a record year and we've controlled expenses very well. So um, we've got a little bit of money to spend. Um, and, and, and like I said, we've spent some of it. We just did that master planning exercise. And so we've got some other things that we, we should be able to consider later this year. It's not going to hurt to prioritize, I think, those immediate priorities. And the things that we that are towards the bottom of the list are probably automatically going to roll in to the next budget process. And if we and then if we have time today, let's look at a high level too at the priorities. As, to, as we're trying to develop that next biannual budget, and we'll have more conversation about that stuff as we in, in future work settings. Is I think where we'll bring some of that just that continues. This time. So, with that sound reason, has shaken this way. Everybody, okay. So, one of my concerns is: Are you comfortable with the direction I've taken my job, and I'm engaging more on a regional? And state level, the, the back the back side to that is I'm not in the office as much, and if that's going to be the case, I have been handing some of those responsibilities to Noah to run the day to day operations, and we're, you know that's expanding his role. And as we do that, um, salary survey work and that uh, whatever we're calling that survey, looking at our org chart, uh, you know, there's just we're probably doing something with Noah's title. And uh, so, uh, just making sure nobody's uncomfortable with that. Uh, and I'm not, I'm still going to be the mayor and I'm still ultimately responsible. But if I'm not there because I'm down in Olympia, somebody's got to run the, run the show uh, and be, you know, be there and accountable. So, um, with that, what do we have on our list mm -hmm. here for current issues? Um, Can I just give a little bit of that? Yes, of please. Context? So, you all had a ton of great ideas, and when the mayor called me about a month and a half ago, he said, okay, we we're bringing all of our council members and our directors together to get a sense of what the priorities are for the 2021 and 2022 biennial budget. And what I heard today was an amazing list of projects that are not going to fit in a two-year budget. And so you saw that I was running back and forth between the sides of the room. Everything that you're seeing here is what the mayor kind of nudged me to say this is more of a kind of current item to consider for your 2021 2022 budget. And then the items that are heading behind that flip chart that I wrote in green are perhaps for later dates that I'll all capture and write um, right up for your summary. But if I'm correct, it's not only for discussion for this 2021 2022 budget. Actually, what we're looking at here is potential items to fund in 20. 2020. Oh, 2020. And then, and then this stuff over here, and what we can't get to is going to flow to 21, 22. Got it. Okay. So the question before your council is what is a priority to fund in 2020 based off of what they heard from Probably the looking at second, you know, second, third quarter. Okay. Not, not tomorrow, but okay. we'll, you know, somewhere later this year. Are any of those projects, I mean, we are briefed that we're going to be doing this, so were any of those projects on those four sheets up there for intentional purposes already funded, or are those all considered new projects? Um, because, you know, what I heard was, was, was definitely staffing, you know, I heard some on the maintenance management, but I, I had a hard time understanding which ones were see, implemented. I mean, this is our, we've got policy here, this is already, so, I hate to draw lines through this stuff, but this is this is done. We yeah. funded you funded this. That's, yeah. Okay, so that's done. That's done. Okay. I mean it's not the body of work's not done. No, you've committed to it, it's in the budget, we're gonna do it. Well I could look, let's be clear on what you mean by future staffing because you've got salary survey. It's a salary survey. We have yet to see My. what is being projected okay. out beyond okay. tomorrow. Okay. So I'm looking at future this staffing. We've heard from the police department, we've heard from all of the departments of what their staffing needs are. We haven't had any kind of a discussion on that. I think that's step, so there's step one, there's two steps to this, I guess. 
Step one is the salary survey and the strategic, I think we had a term for it, strategic, for strategic workforce plan. See a strategic workforce right. plan. That's this $25,000 that you funded. That's a body of work that we're going to complete this year, which is going to give us some results that you, we have to bring back to you to say, yep, you got right, and um, we have all these needs. Once again, it's going to probably tell us we have more needs than we have money, uh, but it'll give us a roadmap. That, that's my point, though. We, we have, as a council, sat down and talked about what is our priority, our, because we can't staff everyone. Correct. And that, so that's is a huge that step. going to tell us what we should be staffing it's going to give us, it's no different than the site tell body of work or other bodies of work that we do. It's going to give us a roadmap of what, what, what it should look like. Because have we set the goal so that we know how to get to that goal? The goal, the, 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 the length, right now, the lens is coming from Noah and Mark and Nick. Because that's the only thing we know is and what's the police sheet. in the police sheet. It's the only thing we know is what's happening within our walls. We're going to hire a consultant to go, uh, you know, the city of Fife does it this way. And the, their model looks, they're going to give us from a different lens. And, and, and what, what are, how our peers are structured. To make, and, and, and maybe that's not so right that's for us. Of the, the, what we need to have a more right. discussion. And that, that's coming. And that will be part of that, that work product will drive in the next budget. So I'm, I'm not advocating really for much in the way of anything for staff. Maybe, a, maybe sooner versus later on a contract. Uh, public information officer, me. So, what I heard is a preamble as we just started this exercise. We're looking specifically at 2020. Yes. And so, to maybe expand upon what you're saying, are we hearing anybody saying we need a staffing plan alteration to add staff in 2020? What I may be hearing is no, we're going to complete these studies, and those staffing plans will be part of the planning session in future budget cycles. Absolutely. So, you yeah. know. So this this conversation right now is simply focused on, you know, what we've already got planned for 2020. Do we want to try to take on anything else? Yeah, or, or what what the balance of this binding budget? Yeah, and what tools can help us now? Because I I can assure you, it's not another project. It's tool, it's tools or resources that will help us improve our workflow. Uh, so I I mean, if I was uh, I guess I'm concerned with, to me, strategic workforce planning goes beyond 2020. Yes. Way beyond. Way okay. beyond. Okay. You're finishing in 2020. I'm only finishing the body of work. developing the plan in 2020. Yes. To bring the green new plan yeah. and the salary survey results so that we can bring and, get and make that part of the next biennial budget process. So we're not going yeah. to really talk about the future that we get this plan to say, oh, we agree, or maybe this is really good. Long term. Well, and I mean, yes. Yes. Okay. What, what I have to say is that they're not going to bring us a plan. No. They're giving us information right. about how it could be staffed. When future staffing went up there, I looked at it more long term as, as to what. Um, growth we're going to have to look at the maps that Nick has brought us. What staffing infrastructure do we need for that? What does our police department need? You know, what so to what me we're talking mean? two different things. Yeah. And this meeting, from my point of view, cannot talk about finances just for 2020. Because you're starting the biennial budget this year, or 20 Later this year. We'll, 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 I think it's set, all of this feeds into, I think we need to look at our shorter term needs and then our longer term needs, and we may not get to all of that discussion today because of the time constraints we have, and we'll bring the rest of that discussion to our work studies ahead of starting July or August budget process. And it's just, 
conversation drivers. So if I may, if I can just kind of our conversation right now, and Jay, I'll get to you in yeah. one second. So my understanding is your priority right now is to look at this list and say, what do you think we can do in 2020? There's only going to be a few things on that list. Anything that isn't captured there is going to likely end up somewhere under 2021 and 2022 budget, but that will happen through a series of work studies. So I think, tell me whether you feel that this was successful. At the end of today, there's a list of three to four projects that maybe could be prioritized in 2020 because there is some money available. And then everything else, it sounds like no and others, that will be kind of the basis of where they start their 2021-2022 plan. That kind of where everyone is. I, I just, I'm struggling with the order for what we're doing. Okay. When we get together and just kind of say, I, I walk into here thinking that I, I don't care about tomorrow. I'm looking at day after tomorrow. Tomorrow is dealt with for a work study. So you're going to come back to us and say, we've got an extra 50 grand we haven't spent, and this is where I think we should spend it, okay. and we deal with it in the work study. So, what so. we do here is more of what we saw from our department heads. The police department wants to change the management style. We've got a workload issue that the DCD is dealing with. We need to figure out right. from the group how are we going to deal with this. Not to some extent, 21 22 was the first step, but we've got to look out for the math. And that's, I guess, the way I was approaching today. Okay, so in five minutes, I can probably tell you what I would advocate we're going to bring forward, and then we'll sell that aside and we'll work on this then. Today. Okay, that's your report for us. So, yeah, and you have five we, may, we, may not, we may not even have enough money for the three or four things that, you know, I think. His laser fish tool is something we've got to do sooner versus later. And you know it's got to find a way to do it. Uh, you know, it's the, it's the, otherwise the, these records just continue to pile up and we're going to have to add more bodies to Grandy's operation. And I don't want to add any bodies because I don't have room for more bodies. Uh, the other pieces, I think, no, or Nick has, has a, the building inspector is going to, is a, is a, it's a problem. And we're going to start falling behind on inspections and processing of building permits. And we know this gentleman's going to retire. Let's get out in front of that. Let's then add an FTE into that. And we'll evaluate when his retire, when he retires. That way we, we, we can plan for this overlap. Um, because if we've got a workforce that's doing 25 or 30 inspections, and the standard out there is a dozen, we hire, he, we wait so he retires and we hire a new person. We're going to end up hiring two people. Let's let's get somebody up to speed and evaluate, come back and evaluate that um, staffing need and when, whether the economy is still strong. I think those are two important things. Um, I don't know about you guys. I'm getting tired, and I can deal with it, but I'm getting tired of you getting beat up and being in the re reactionary mode in public information. And, and I, I don't, I'm not advocating to hire an employee, but I think for $20,000 or $25,000, we can enter into a contract with consultants to help us revamp our work page, or, you know, we have to have anybody that develops content. Um, I, I think that could be important, but it isn't our biggest priority at all. I mean, we're, we're, we're doing it, it's just, um, we have people manipulating information out there, and, and all we can do is present facts. Um, hey, can I add one thing? To go back to the building inspector, the concern I have from an HR perspective, and maybe you can share this, uh, is the recruiting. The building inspectors are tough to recruit and hire, so the process in which they should get a competent building inspector to hire this week might be a lengthy process. So I just want to point that seat is. Uh, in the public sector, that is a difficult position. I've seen in multiple cities where it's just hard to find somebody that's able to do the job because the private sector is much more robust in its financial package. And what they're doing, you're trying to extract the able to do what they're doing to kind of that. So that's something to consider. Mayor, two I heard was I heard Mark talk about an electrician. And I wasn't quite sure where he was with that. And I want to say, take it off the line, I'm fine. And the second one was, I'd have to count the numbers up, but I, 
I think we're also looking at an additional police officer this year. And we are, but we've already approved it. Okay, so that's the sergeant. And so there is another request coming in the next biannual budget to add another sergeant and potentially take current patrol officers and make them corporals. But the chiefs need, we couldn't, even if you approved an FDD, I couldn't get you, I couldn't get another police officer hired to fill that. That is a, we've got two right now that we need, and it'll take us a year from the day we hire them to get them on the street. It is pointless to try to stuff another body in that when we couldn't even recruit. That's fine. Those are the two needs I heard. And then the second one, I'll address Mark Seal. We've added seven or eight people in the last four years to Public Works, and we've got a whole bunch of turnover. And what I've asked our Public Works Department is, we're not, I don't, I'm not going to advocate, and you could choose differently, but I don't think we should add any more bodies until we can get our arms around and get them executing at a high level. And I'm not saying we're doing a bad job, but we can do a better job. And I think we need to look, Mike is buried, there is no doubt about it, but I think step one is no different than what Nick's doing with his inspectors, is we have a company that's on call so that when Mike has more work than he can do, that this company comes in and does some of that work. And when that level, when that's, when that consultant, like Nick's is doing right now, is doing more work than the cost of an employee, that's when we just add a second employee. I don't think we have enough work for two electricians. So I'm telling you what I've heard from both of you. Yeah. Yeah, so I wanted to make sure we're all responding to the same question. So let's hear yours, and then I want to bring us back. Yeah, I have a question. Maybe I have a statement. So I think today was extremely productive, and I think the staff did a good job bringing everything together. What might be missing is for the council to sit down and come up with our visions, right, to spend a half a day. That's kind of what I thought today was going to be a little bit more about. I know some of it ran long, but, and then we come back together and see how those two marry as we go to the future. Okay. Whereas missing, I think, the long-term perspective of the council from a policy standpoint, these are all great things. And also what I'm hearing from probably not going to move the needle, but it's going to make a difference. Well, I think that's what we're hearing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
so that we don't get to the budget deliberations in November. And you, we've delivered on what your expectations are. I, I know when I first got on the council, John and I and other members of the Fountain Finance Committee would blow up the whole budget and start over. Um, because there was administration and there was no communication. Okay? And then it was like, what are you thinking? We need to do it. We need to go this way. Is it really difficult to get all of these documents to do a PDF and we know about? That's what I'm going to do. Speaking of records retention, I have already read this one. All the records of Lori. I think this is great when we have that session. Yeah. And Brandy's already capturing all of this, so you don't have to do it. Brandy's going to, Brandy, if you want it all in one big email, each one of these, I don't know if we want, because each one is a. Maybe we get it by department. Yeah, it'll be by department. That's what you'll get. But why couldn't we just have one? Why don't we have to open up 14 PDFs? I was going to say, can't we get some of these things summarized that, you know, we've heard all these chapters? So what he's going to do is summary document. And then we'll marry that with Randy's body of work. So if you want it, I guess we can do it in one PDF for those that want it that way. But I know it's going to come to Brandy in uh, in each department. Send it back. And it is one PDF. Okay, we'll, we'll do that. Too. Okay. And give us all the stuff. It's really great, and I very much appreciate the workload that public work has done in 2019 and all the achievements that they've made. That's great. What about 22? Let's give a summary that the police department is projecting yeah. X number of additional positions, a change in the management structure. Uh, you know, DCD has a challenge for the next few years if building continues. You know, let's get that out on a piece of paper so that we can kind of see, as opposed to, let's see, what did the police department say? I think we have that. So in terms of you can have the next 20 minutes of your time wisely, it sounds like, and this came from Pastor Member Clausen, but it sounds like if you want to give the thumbs up to your mayor. To kind well, of, they're, they're going to give the thumbs up when I bring the specific okay. items to the council. Okay. And I'm just, I'm making them aware, I think we've got some pressing issues that we need to address sooner versus later. Okay. But we've got to find revenue first to pay for these things, which is... 45 days out. You're going to prioritize it based on you bringing it to us. You're going to say that the laser fish is the most important thing, or the building inspector is the, this is the priority what you're proposing. Yeah. I'm not going to stand here and say, you know, I think you should move the public information officer after you. That's not my role. Yeah. I think you're going to see these first two pretty darn quick. And Great. Come up with a plan for the number three, and yeah. we all agree to go forward. Yep, I, I will be bringing more information and how we're going to pay for it as soon as I have the information. Um, of these other, uh, do you guys want to talk about what your, of, of what you heard, what are your hot buttons and priorities? Uh, well, I can tell you money right off, I don't need to tell you, sorry. But, you know, I'm, I've got to be convinced yet with the police department, why are we putting in another level of so I guess I don't understand well enough what it is that this layer is going to accomplish when, when I hear that we have just a year on that box issue so that we can do the training that meets requirements. Where do we get the benefit of the court? I'm not sure. So I just need to understand more. And I can see that a little bit. Okay, well, I don't think I, you can answer it right now, Rob. I guess you asked for that buttons. I think that, that answer comes here. It, it, and then we, Chief's got some data to support that, but it's going out to our peers and checking in and seeing if, how, how's everybody else doing this? Yeah, and, and that will answer the country here. How is it going to benefit for us? What, what are we going to yeah. gain? And it's not that I'm against it, it's just, it's a, not that we're changing it. I just need to understand better as well. Okay, that's good to hear. Others? Okay. Um, I thought it was fabulous the amount of information that was gathered up. Uh, and I don't mean, you know, drink the fire hose, but certainly we did this 18 months ago. And it certainly was a lot more information because of the additional projects. Right now, uh, you guys keep saying, hey, we're full, and, and we are. And so 
you know, during the production, you know, we're just trying to stay afloat and how to get more efficient uh, going in the, the next financial budget, I think, is the right way to go. And I would echo John's comments too, even there. So you're ready to say something like that? Uh, well, I am very concerned about the infrastructure downtown as an immediate thing, so that's covered, right? The infrastructure? The electrical infrastructure downtown. Yeah, that's on the work plan, the, yeah. the electrical on the key. Right, that's immediate. Um, I'm a little concerned about top heavy, and I'm just saying, little town, we're expecting a lot of growth, but can we afford the growth? You're talking top heavy from top staffing heavy, or management? Top or? heavy, police, top heavy. Okay. And I'm actually a little bit concerned, quite frankly, about you not being in the office as much. That's just me. Because um, I'm not sure um, how, what you're doing out there, and I know that your involvement is good. Um, what I'm not sure about is if we're leading into a city manager type position of unemployment, I don't know if that's the direction you're thinking. Um, what does that mean for you, and what does that mean for all of us? I'd like more discussion on that. Um, what I can share, uh, I know the million dollars that we got from um, for Tremont, yeah. we wouldn't have got if I wasn't on um, the state board and engaged in PSR, the in fact engaged in PSR. I, I believe that. And that's, and, and as we heard, and, and I'm, you know, if, I, if I, I want me to be in the office more and dial it back, I can. I and, uh, but we heard, what was the number? We got $100 million in projects, and we've got, uh, if we increase the impact piece, it'll give us $17 million. If it doesn't, we'll get $11 million. That money's coming from somewhere else, and it's from the state, and we got Mark, and it's not just me. I've got Noah, Brandy, Nick, Mark, all of us are engaged in regional and state agencies, and uh, it's really important. Prior administration didn't allow staff to do that, uh, and I think it's vital, and, and, and it does. It takes away from our time in the office. There's no doubt about it. If there's a cost to that. Mayor, can I make a suggestion for the our wrap up now because we're kind of going in that direction? I found it really helpful just to hear from a few of you about like what's sticking out in your head at the end of today. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can just kind of sit back and I can just capture it in a note and it's less of a Q&A and more of just a around okay. the room. I'll show but you are going to start it. Do you want to just, and then we can just go around the room and then that can be in my notes kind of where you begin when you have that next session that thinks John like five, seven years out or whatever it would be. So, sure. so I guess maybe a takeaway from you today is just seeing everything and you know, understanding the last few minutes of conversation because it relates to 2020. Again, we're not here to be in your way. But I do like the direction each of you are heading for the remainder of this year talking about efficiency. That, that's the right line of thinking. That, that's something that can be really impactful and could, you know, be beneficial. Instead of just doing this and doing that, I can focus on efficiency. I think mean, I mean, I'm definitely support that. I think that's your call. Um, and I think as we move forward, just my reflection on the last year or two, because we've been so busy, I feel like at times, and sometimes it takes two to three weeks for me to realize this, that maybe sometimes we put the, the car in front of the horse a little bit. We're so quick to want to get something done that maybe we're slightly doing things out of order. And let's just make sure. So I think that priority and plan is just to make sure, you know, for example, um, we've got this incredible downtown study going, but then we also have this RFP that we're looking at next week. Those out of order? I don't know. I think we should have that dialogue. It's a lot of money. I just think we should be thinking about that. Just, just more, more proactive approach to things is, is from a strategic standpoint. And we're not always just, it's the topic of the week and let's try to get this through council next month and it might not fit into that strategic plan. So that's it. I thought you want me to say it again, right? Um, that's everything I said. Okay. She, she, yeah, I wasn't uh, taking what okay. you were doing. Real, 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 real quickly, quickly. Yeah. Uh, ditto about this is not for 20, 2020, uh, more for 21, 22 biennial uh, budget. Uh, Rob's mayor, building on what John said, go forth, have fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I didn't say fun. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> uh, but uh, no, that uh, the city's doing a good job with uh, the resources that it has. In fact, 
not the same with Judge, but at least there's something else like that. I would just like, or I try to keep in mind what it is about Philadelphia that I like. And is it residential neighborhoods? And are these characters that we want to preserve as a long way? Because that sounds just scary. But what is the appeal of the area? And how can we make sure that we're capitalizing on it without losing something? And the other thing that I think we may need to address at some time is emerging social issues, which I'm glad that you touched on earlier, such as the homelessness, which is becoming more visible in parts of the city. So I'm glad that you mentioned it. It's not an easy topic. But I think if we start keeping that in mind and just figuring out how we can address it. And Councilmember McClawson, what I had for you, because that's when I started typing, was about concern about the extra layer of management in the police department, as well as just allowing the near-term issues to be within the purview of the mayor and to really focus on longer-term issues with the council. Yeah, and that's not to diminish any of these others, because I think, you know, Frederick's and homelessness, I was paying attention when we were going through specifically, you know, we have this whole thing with homelessness, and we have this thing with drug addiction, and we have, you know, I mentioned carbon footprints. So, I mean, we've got some big issues that some of them are being addressed. I'd like to have some more discussion on a couple of them, just so that, you know, we can get behind whatever a list of the goals that I mentioned earlier. It would be nice to get on to, but, again, I'm just, I'm trying to respect what my role is as a policy versus the mayor's role, you know, in all this stuff. So, it's fun for us to be able to say, you know, I think you need to change the color of the car, but is that really our role? So, that's all. Representations. Well, don't leave them that way. Absolutely. And, Cindy, what I heard from you was concern about being top-heavy and about the electrical infrastructure downtown. So, anything else that sticks out in your head from today? Well, I'm concerned about our growth. We have all of these projects that are pending that require all this infrastructure and the juggling and building inspectors. And how are we really managing our growth? And will this area still be affordable at the end of that? What have, you know, the trend that we have ongoing right now is a concern to me, just because I think it's being forced on us too quickly. We're not going to be able to handle it. I'm sure, you know, the addition of staff is not going to take care of it, because we're talking about projects where there's going to be 500 apartments or something. You know, how are we going to handle the traffic congestion? The consequences of that. I don't feel that we're ready for it or that we're ready to handle all of that. And it seems to me that there needs to be more planning. There's so many projects I don't even know. Yeah, but I don't know how they're handling all of that. I don't know how we're going to capture the needs of the expenses of all of that into any kind of impact fee that would really cover it. I'm concerned about what that looks like 15 years out. And will people who live here now still be able to afford to live here? You know, that's a really huge thing that I'm just saying in general. I am concerned about Port Orchard citizens being able to afford to live in Port Orchard in 5 to 10 years. So affordability, traffic, all the kind of side effects of growth. Yes. So I share a concern with the record. I can't disagree with it. I think Cindy touched on the millions of dollar question. But I think what we're seeing today is a consequence of all the growth that's being thrown at us. So we've got much more. I'm also concerned about the chief coming in and giving a presentation. That is a pretty big commitment from the city. But we'll know more with the report that's coming. I think with what we've talked about, the career position, for example, that looks like a much quicker analysis of our needs and being able to support the filling of the position for the inspector. One of the things that I think is important is to take a look at what we talked about last year. And I think you sent out a summary of the retreat from last year. One of the things we didn't really touch on, although we did a little bit, was 
address homelessness issues, including the city of Puerto Rico's approach to tiny houses and emergency air reports. And I think that's an issue that we're going to continue to grapple with until we talk about it more as a country. So I'd like to make sure that we um, don't forget the homelessness issue that we have. Um, and I share concerns about affordable housing and infrastructure. And so I think our work efforts. So, right, just quickly on that tiny home issue, it's not that it would be included in our code, and Commissioner Rio has a dozen or more of these structures. It's every time a slight site is selected, it's the, you know, if that community comes together very loudly and says, not my neighborhood. Yeah, and, and we hear that no matter yeah, what. And it, it's not included in from our code. Those could be built. Uh, and so, are we going to force it on someone in a, in a, in a neighborhood? That's, uh, yeah. I think the discussion I'm here was tiny houses as a, would be a tiny house village for homelessness, traditional housing, not a tiny home on a block. Oh, look, be simple. What's that? Courtyard of homes. Be simple. Well, like, kind of what the county was, the county was about to in San Jose, we're going to have a bunch of. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. for a little while. Yeah, I yeah. know. It's been probably four sites identified. Yeah. So the other seems like maybe more a future study session, work session, work study. I'm trying to use your vocabulary. Yeah. Work study? Okay. Yeah. So anything else in terms of your no. big picture takeaways? Okay, thank you. Councilmember Ashby, what's going to stick in your head tomorrow when you're going back to business? Well, I'm going to echo what Cindy said. But I think one of the most important things for this council to engage in it is to understand the implications of our growth. And we know we're going to have growth. But as, as Cindy listed off a number of, of items, elements that come under growth, and there's even more than that. So before we raise our hand at KRCC or PSRC, we're saying yes, we're going to take in 15,000 people or whatever this number is. I think we truly need to understand the implications of that. What are, what exactly in my neighborhood alone, and I appreciate Mr. Bond came out and talked to some of my neighbors or one of my neighbors because they're cutting down their trees, you know. And if you um, go up to the new McCormick Woods areas, old McCormick Woods is very tree. And their new berries are not. If you go down here to Andazio and what they're doing with blueberry, there's no trees. So as this growth happens, are we losing our time? I mean, there's just a lot. I think that we really, really need to understand the growth. And we need to understand the, um, the order with which those decisions and growth happen, exactly as, as what Sean was saying. So the other thing that, two other points I wanted to make is regarding the mayor being out in the office. It's, it was a shock to all of us to find out that Port Orchard actually qualified to have a seat at the executive board at PSRC. I believe there's a lot more to our city that we may not understand because we've been here so long. I think there's a great value to have a regional presence and a state presence. I think it's almost critical for us. The other thing is, again, Sean makes us aware of this all the time, we look at um, the priorities of the, the elements in the money, and I'm not opposed to any of them, but do you know how easy it is to spend money? If you have a little bit of money extra, you don't know how many times you can spend that. And so we have to be very cognizant of, of, of how that money is spent. And is it one-time revenue that needs to go to a one-time source? Or is it ongoing revenue that can go to an ongoing expense? I mean, those things really need to be married. Um, and it's just really, really easy to say, oh, that's only $25,000. $70,000. The um, downtown um, Sudbury plan, we only had to come up with 150. We have to come up with 170. You know, because we were putting so much, we were making a nice contribution.
Thirteen months. Right. All this is thirteen million. Right. Well, and the other thing to add one more on what I was going to say is, as we've said today, Tremont was a twenty million dollar idea, and it took all of our resources, human resources, financial resources, to make that happen at the expense of our neighbors. You know, so we have to look, the, the mayor refers to it as the Long Meadows area. Well, it's everything from Tremont South on city. You know, that neighborhood is a mess. I lived there 30 years ago and it was a mess then. And now we have all this infill construction in there. So we have to figure out how to provide relief to those folks. And that's not the only neighborhood. It's, it's just the one that is really flaring to me. And if they write emails to us about So those are things. I think we as a council have some big level things to look at. And, and we have limited resources. But we need to understand the whole picture before we make independent, isolated decisions. Jenny, do you want to share what's exactly right? Um, for me, that salary and staffing survey that's coming up is, is just crucial. I, if I'm in sitting in your side of this table, I would want you, would want you to want your department directors to be champions for their department, right, and advocating for their department. So that third party outside view of how other cities do it, how other ways to cut this pie, um, efficiencies that can be gained, I think, are just really crucial for us going forward. No, you want to hear 20 seconds? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my takeaway is I'm really thrilled to have this council and this mayor work with us for the next four years. And that's honestly true, because you guys are talking about the right things. And we're not going to have change over here, which means we're going to be talking about this for the next couple of years, planning these major issues out financially and policy wise. So I'm thrilled with the team with that. I, I agree. This, uh, you know, these are good problems to have. And for those of us, six years ago that we were in this room, um, it wasn't nearly as fun. And, and I was questioning my role in it. And I'm glad I made the decision that I made, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, so were you. And, uh, and, you know, and, and I think this transportation committee we created is vital. There are some big transportation things, from, as we talked about, Flower Meadows, Bethel, Sedgwick, Oh, Clifton Road. I mean, we've got a lot of needs, a lot of priorities, and to have that focus on that is really important. And, and a lot of other things. Nick, you want to give your 10 seconds? Well, I, your brain? I guess uh, two points. Um, you know, we I, we have enough on our plate right now that I think, to some degree, I'm hoping I'm bringing you less things to vote on so that I can put my head down and get get things done for the next few months. Uh, other than the transportation committee, which I'm also very excited about as we uh, head forward into our conditioning and budget process. And, and other than that, at the, the rate that we are growing right now, one of the things, you know, if you want to speed things up or slow things down, your fees and impact fees is a great way to kind of meter that or at least harness that power. And uh, um, I think that, you know, if we knew we were going to be this 55 years ago, when the consultant brought us the impact fee at a higher level, we maybe uh, would have considered things differently than, than we did, but let's let's make sure we take advantage of an economy that's just super needed right now. And Brandon, do you want to give your post-it note takeaway? Yeah, so my takeaway is that just as, as much as important is for you guys to hear other departments directors roles and for you guys to set policy and move the city forward, and I think it's also important that us directors get to hear the other departments and we have this um, cohesive um, roadmap for the next couple years. And I think that um, it's, and I can speak to the mayor when he says the last six years it's been pretty, um, it, it's a 180 from what it was to what it is now. And I think that's, we lose sight of, of always going back to what it was and, and we need to move forward. And, we are in a great position from the city, from the directors, the council, to the mayor, and even to our citizens as to where we were six years ago. And, and I think that we've, we've moved the needle a lot. And it's, um, 
and it gives us, the mayor, um, new, I'm trying to think, ways to put things on the agenda for you guys to hear and not, like he said, the day, like you guys said, the day, mayor's day-to-day -day operations doesn't need to come to you guys. It's an overall, and I, the other takeaway that I'm getting is that you know, maybe this should be a, more of a two-day retreat. You know, it's important to hear ours, but we also need to hear yours to, to move forward. And, and sometimes when you have that time lapse, you forget. And you know, like I said, last year when we had a retreat, what about this? We didn't get to, to talk about this, so maybe it's more of a, a two-day retreat and get everybody hear one side, hear the other side, and then what's the, the final plan? So I find it extremely valuable. Extremely valuable. So Mary, I'll wrap up with my piece and then I'll let you find the final word. I, I think I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> so to help you all be successful moving forward, what I'm going to do is take all these fantastic presentations, pull out where I heard there were priorities, put them maybe on one sheet if possible, squish it down, um, and then also just make sure that some of the questions and answers were captured here as well. I'll also um, transcribe all of these ideas as best as possible. I will try to you know, color coordinate them or do something so that it's clear what is near term and what is related to one department versus what is longer term. And that is something that you can use after you kind of have your goals. You can start throwing the different priorities underneath those goals and then ranking them. So that will hopefully set you up, but I just want to reflect on three things that I heard throughout the day. One is real appreciation for the work that your departments are doing. And so I've been to a number of different council retreats and things over my six years at Triangles, and the level of appreciation was just noticeable for me. And the second thing is I am amazed with how complementary your interests and skills are. From the first thing we all did this morning, which was looking at different committees, I don't know whether it was um, some good omen or something, but it really, you have very complementary skills, which is a strength for you all moving forward. So I think today we have a lot of information, and I think it's going to be a stepping stone as you create your next budget, which is, I think, my understanding, pretty difficult in the, you know, the second year of a two-year cycle, and you're doing all the right thinking and work. And so hopefully what I produce will send you forward in that direction. And I just had a good time today with you all. So thank you. And with that, do you want to fast forward? The, uh, you know, I, I touched on it earlier, I, I, I believe we, from, from you, the staff, all of us, uh, the team we assembled is phenomenal. And, uh, so, and I'm, I'm proud of the work we're doing. Um, you know, it, you know it's, and of course, we need to continue to raise the bar. Our, our citizens demand it of us, and, and we will. Uh, but I think we, gosh, what we've accomplished in the last three or four years, is, uh, who would have, I mean, I was questioning six months in, but we're going to get a free month then, and how are we going to do that? And the parks we've opened, and I'm just, I'm just thrilled with the job we're doing. And these are good problems to have, and fortunately, we're in a robust economy, and, and, and we're going to have the resources to solve some of these things, not all of it, and we're never going to make everybody happy. Um, we've got a lot of work to do, but I know we've got the right team to do it. So thank you. Very good.